So that brings us to our speaker for the evening, who's probably uh, you know wondering why we do all this. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, Dr. Gary Hare has been here before as a speaker uh, when he was. Uh, uh, CEO of KMOS, uh, right in the early years of the 2000s, and uh, we heard him speak at that point about uh, the future plans for Amiga, and uh, so at, at this point, uh, we, the little bit of information that I have on him is he has a distinguished history in media strategy and innovation, along with a short time as the CEO of Amiga E, uh, and we, without further ado, would like to welcome Gary to the podium to share his thoughts with us. Scary when the speaker has notes, right? <laughs> you know, first of all, I'm pretty much convinced that Bill and Trevor asked me to join you this evening simply to test my memory. Because uh, I know when I get home, my wife's going to say, How did it go? And when I walked in this afternoon, four of you came up to me and said, Oh, I remember when you were here last time. And Bill told me that was 20 years ago. So I'm going to tell my wife, these guys have really good memories. <laughs> because I don't remember being here last time. <laughs> so if I repeat myself, don't remind me of that. <laughs> and Trevor tried, tried right before I came up here to ask me if I maybe should have a, you know, a shot of two of whiskey prior to speaking. And I turned that down. And so if this doesn't go well, remind me that was a mistake. <laughs> I did a little research just to remind myself. And so I started with my resume, which none of you have ever seen. In fact, other than when I was offered a position at the university, no one's ever asked for it in the last 30 years. But I do have a thing on Amigo on my resume. I think the dates are right. And the title's right. And here's what I wrote. This is all that's there. Don't ask for the resume. <laughs> it says, an unsuccessful attempt at relaunching this iconic brand. <laughs> and that, I think, was my contribution to the two years I was there. Now, other stuff happened, and I'll tell you about some of that stuff. But in reality, it was an unsuccessful attempt. So what was the attempt? Why did I start it? Was it a good idea? All that kind of stuff. I was asked to come to a university about 15 years ago. I retired, sort of, two years ago. And uh, they were starting a new doctoral program in media psychology. So it gave me an opportunity to be, to be whimsical. You know, you go, you want to mess around with VR, you can do whatever you want to do. You know, it was a pretty cool job. The media psychology program was relatively small, the largest doctoral program ago. This university had one of the largest clinical psychology programs in, in the country, one of the largest in the world. And I still hear from students from that clinical program, one just as recently as seven weeks ago. She wrote me a note and said, I'm $240,000 in debt. And the best job I was qualified for was with a VA hospital in West Virginia making $54,000. Do you have any idea what I could do? What should I do? And I said, well, first of all, move out of West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> but second of all, it's pretty tough to have a corporate job that pays you less than six figures, particularly if you're in California, New York, parts of Texas. And you know, this corporate job thing, I think, is interesting. And I look back on my life. I've worked with most of the large tech companies, I think, at one time or another. And there are two that I really, really liked. And I, I do not hesitate to say that these were good, honest, innovative companies. And you could trust what they said. One of them was Philips. And some of you know I was CEO of Philips Media in Europe for a while. as a founding CEO. They gave me a card table and a telephone on the top floor of a building in London and said, go build this company, would you? And I sat around there and ordered uh, biscuits, you know, and tea for a couple of days. And then I looked at my telephone and thought, maybe I should call somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and I called everyone I knew. And to make a long story short, over the next 15 months, we had design studios in eight countries and distribution in 11. 
But I knew at Phillips that if I went to the CEO and said, I need this or I need that, I would get it. And the other one was Intel. When Intel started their, their division that was designed to make new content for new platforms, they went out and they would say, they would look at something you did and say, we like what you did, could you do something that's kind of like that but in this category? They would fund it, they wouldn't ask questions. We designed the early days of the internet, the first virtual museums in the world. If you've been to the Van Gogh Museum, the interactive Van Gogh, that was us. That was my company. And with the Van Gogh Museum, it's fascinating because we had a situation where we could do whatever we wanted with one of the most famous painters and one of the most famous sites in the world. So what did we do? We did a virtual tour on dial-up internet. And you could choose one of three people to take you through. You could get, you know, the curator, nice black suit, black tie, you know, all that kind of stuff. You could get Van Gogh himself in his own words. <laughs> you could get a hippy dippy art student, which most people <laughs> want to do that part. And we did two really innovative things. When I first saw the innovative things, when my designers came up and showed them to me, I said, I don't think we can do that, can we? They took two of Van Gogh's most famous paintings. Remember the Blue Room painting? You know that one with furniture and all that? We turned it into 3D. You could walk into the group of Blue Room painting and you could walk around the furniture. You could do all that kind of stuff. And we did a really cool thing that Van Gogh people absolutely hated. You could move the furniture. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, you know that furniture was as sensitive as an issue. <laughs> There's a lot of things you can do innovative when you're in a big company. They have a lot of resources. They don't necessarily have any idea about what you're doing. So that really was my suggestion at that time. And then a venture capital firm came to me and said, would you be at all interested in trying to help us relaunch an asset that we own? And that asset turned out to be Amiga. And at the time, I had accepted another position. Remember in the early days of the internet, you always had tried to define and describe a new media with an analogy of one that's known. And no one knew what the internet was going to be. So everybody said, and Microsoft was really behind a lot of this, it's going to be channels. It's going to be kind of like television, certainly like cable. It's going to be channels. And they hired a friend of mine, Brandon Tartikoff, who was the president of NBC, to run that. And Brandon came to me and said, we're going to have 12 channels. And I said, good for you. And he said, we'd like you to run four of them. Oh. I said, I'd like it better if you asked me to run like two of them. Oh. And so we went back and forth. And we were pretty close. You know, we're pretty close. Uh, it's a long negotiation and what have you. And then one day, um, Brandon was 44 years old and he died of brain aneurysm. Just got out of bed one morning. His wife went in to find out what's going on. He was just laying on the floor dead. And so I had time. I had the luxury of time when this VC came to me. And so I knew I had that. And I said, well, I'll think about this, but I'm going to go talk to some people. So I got on a plane. I went to Seattle. I talked to some folks up there. I went to the UK, and I talked to some folks up there. I talked to a good friend of mine that's an investment banker and said, what do you think? And as I talked to people, I liked some of the people that were at the Amiga. I like the enthusiasm of all of you around the world. But what I, what I really liked when I met people like, like Ray and like Fleecy and like Vince and like some of those other folks that many of you probably know, these were people that were not only committed to that platform, but have put a lot of blood and treasure into it. Most of them had worked without any compensation at all for over a year, some longer than that. So I, I really liked what they were doing. And I looked at that, and I said, well, maybe I should do this. And every single person that I know, every single close friend I have in technology, told me not to. Not because they, they had nothing bad about Amiga. They just didn't think it was a good opportunity, a good financial opportunity. And they knew my personality. And you guys don't know my personality, but I'm very easy to get along with much of the time. <laughs> but, so I looked at this, 
and it, I tried to figure out what strategy one would try to deploy to relaunch something like this. My art director, my longtime art director, had an Amiga in her studio. I'm not sure what she did with it, but I know there was an Amiga there. And so I wasn't unfamiliar with it. I was very familiar with the early days of Atari, so you know. Uh, Trevor told, you, told me I should tell you this story about Nolan Bushnell. Somebody's recording this, and I'm sure I get sued if I actually tell this story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was involved in the design and production of Ball Blazer. And Ball Blazer was a big deal, yeah. And so when we knew we, we knew we needed content with Amiga, right? So I went to Lucas Games and said, you know, license this to me. And we were negotiating that right up to the very end. And I'll get to the very end in a second. So we, so my role that I negotiated was, I will hire the people, I will help create the products, <coughs> we will set up distribution, but I will not raise money. You're the venture capital company, and I got an idea of how much money we need to get through the first two years. And so if this amount of money is on hand, then count me in. So I took about three months, plus or to four, to finally make this decision. And finally, I joined. I think I had joined just briefly when I was here last time. I don't think I've been around for very long. And as it turns out, there wasn't any money. It wasn't a million dollars, or three million dollars, or five million dollars, and it wasn't one dollar. There was no money. No money. I talked to a good friend of mine, he's a business development guy, and I said, Ron, would, will you join me if I have to raise money to do this? And he said, well, let's go talk to some people. So because of Felici and people like that, the strategy initially was, that we were going to be in the hardware business, a business that I know nothing about. But it seemed to make sense. I know a lot of you felt we should have been. We used to be. So relaunch what we used to be. I talked to Greg, another guy that worked with me at the time. About two weeks ago, I ran into him, and I said, I'm going to go talk to this mega thing. And so like, how many VCs and investment banks and strategic people did we talk to? And he said, I think it was 36. 36. And for the most part, people would look at us, they knew the Commodore story, they knew what's happening in the hardware market, they knew the hardware market was big guys, the Sony's, the Mashusta's, the Microsoft's of the world, and they just went, number one, you can't relaunch hardware for $5 million, and number two, we're not interested. But now you got a problem. So I asked, the company for a stock ledger. I said, well, if we're going to try and raise money, we've got to make sure that it's clean, right? So all a stock, stock ledger is is a list of how many people own stock, what their name is, and how many shares. Sometimes what they paid for. That's all it is. So I got the stock ledger. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. But I noticed a curious thing on the stock ledger. One of the people on there, seemingly an individual investor, owned a large number of preferred shares. I don't know how many of you have tried to raise money, but no investor is going to come in and put money in if somebody's got preferred shares, right. putting them in first place in case you go bankrupt or merge or have a reverse split or anything like that. So I flew to Europe and I met with this person. And it was supposed to be a short dinner. It's a nice little place in Germany. Uh, I, we, we ate early. And we were still there at 3 o'clock in the morning. And finally, I kind of convinced him that we had two choices. All of the money he had put in was gone, or he converts and maybe I could figure out some way to get some of his money back. And he agreed with some conditions. So I took that back to New York and I said, here's the agreement, here's the conditions, you guys are supposed to be responsible for this, I'm not responsible for money, see you around, I'm going back to San Francisco. And then I was told, it's done, but well, not immediately, but within about 90 days. Don't worry about it, taken care of. It. So I was fine with that. 
my philosophy of life is just to trust people that you work with and tell them some reason not to. And almost all the time, if you trust somebody, there is no reason not to. They trust you back. We finally brought in a little bit of money, about 15% of what the agreed amount was supposed to be. So when I saw that, I asked for another stock ledger. What's the change? And it was a really weird thing. I don't remember the exact amount was paid per share. It's over $2, let's say $2.50 a share. And now we've got listed some Amiga employees, people who have been around a long time. They're, they're advocates, they're dedicated, they're enthusiasts, they're just like you guys, except they've been working without, hopefully you get paid for what you do, they've been working without compensation for a long, long time. And the employees, the founder stock, you know, I don't have any pet founder stock. The last time I had founder stock, the price was a tenth of a thousandth of a cent per share. I think I had 1.5 million shares in stock and I had to give $138 to pay for that. It turned out to be not worth the entire $138, but that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the employee's founder stock was priced at the same price as the investor that was brought in. The same price as the investor that was brought in. They used their employees to increase the valuation of their company. I've never heard anything like this. I've heard a lot of bad stuff. I've never heard anything like this. And I said, that's the first thing I plan to fix. And it did. The investors started to get interested when we changed our pitch and our focus. Let's remember when we were at that time, OK? Early days of mobile. Not a lot of smartphones out there. But mobile had this vision, not only people being able to talk on the phone, but maybe be able to do some other stuff. And some of that other stuff was games. There weren't very many good mobile games. In fact, you can count them on probably one hand at that time. Maybe one hand has been run over by a lawnmower at that time. <laughs> <laughs> but there weren't very many good ones out there. But there were a couple. But we could go into a VC or a strategic partner and show them something they'd never seen before. We could take a Nokia phone and run software on it, on the Amiga operating system. And then we could take a different phone and run the same software without rewriting a line of code. It was truly a right one solution to a world that didn't even know they needed to write at all. But a couple looked at that and said, this is really promising. And one very strategic partner looked at that and said, we're interested. So now I knew we were onto something. There were some glitches <coughs> along the way, but there was interest. So we had a situation where We knew that if we played this correctly, we would be able to get the investor from a strategic partner that would help us with distribution. I was pretty excited about it. It takes a long time, as some of you probably heard the phrase, you've got to kiss a lot of frogs. Some of those frogs live in Silicon Valley. <laughs> kissed most of them and dated a couple. <laughs> and it didn't work out as well as you might hope. There was no prince that I could find down there. But now I have a term sheet. The first time I have a term sheet. Two years in, I've got a term sheet for the amount of money that we need. And so I asked for an updated accurate stock ledger. And I guess I got one. And I saw this stock ledger. I walked out of the office in New York. I called my attorney in California. And I said, Doug, I have this, and he was very familiar with the previous two stock ledgers, and I said, I just got this stock ledger. It's completely different from anything we've ever seen. And he said, where are you? And I said, I'm in New York. He said, all right. 
drive to the airport and fly back to San Francisco. Meet me at 7.30 tomorrow morning. I'll have your letter, letter of resignation ready to fax. I was a CEO. I mean, I should have known about these things, right? I mean, you could say, you should have known that, and you, you would be right. I should have. But once I knew what was happening here, you cannot stay. You cannot stay. I mean, the ethical principles are staggering. The financial repercussions of having knowledge of something like this and staying to make it continue would be staggering. And so I, I resigned. I left. And I didn't think about it much anymore. There's some things I should have asked, many things probably, I should have asked along the way. How did, and I don't know the answer to this, by the way, it's a question you might ask, and then I'll tell you then I don't know the answer, so I'll just tell you now. <laughs> How did a venture capital company get control of a company and its assets without an exchange of value? I don't know. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you get the assets of a company, any company of almost any size, without one dollar exchanging hands, exchanging value. I don't know. I can guess. Trevor guessed in his book. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I honestly don't know how you pull that off. What was this thing called CAMOS? It didn't exist when I started. CAMOS stands for Curry McEwen Operating System. I had questions. I'd seen this happen in a couple of other technologies where founders controlled one asset, a pivotal asset, in this case an operating system. And then they want to lease it back to the company so that they have two channels of revenue out of the same product line. My position was pretty simple. I don't care what you call it. I called it chaos, but that was just me. Um, <laughs> but that asset stays in the company. And not only that, I'd like you to meet my attorney, who came with me from California to make sure that these things were done properly. And then finally, how did some of the, exist, the investors, the existing investors, get shares? Now, I, I can't tell you this is specifically what happens, but this is often what happens. Let's say you're a venture capital company, and you've got three companies. One of them's pretty hot, one of them's kind of warm, one of them's neither. Let's say Amiga's the kind of warm. And you got some investors that come in and say, I'd like to buy 10,000 shares of the pretty hot. And you go, cool, we'll sell that to you if you buy 5,000 shares of the kind of warm. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you have an investor base that you didn't have before, that you never heard of before. And that's oftentimes what happens. And it's a situation that is very, very difficult for management to deal with. You don't know where your investor people are coming from. And particularly if you don't have investors and you're not a public company, you want to know that. You want to know that for sure. So looking back, what would I have done differently? I guess the simple answer was, I would have said no. Okay. And now that I know that I can't relaunch it anyway, it's very simple, I should have said no. But the other thing I think I would have probably done differently is that I would have focused only on strategic investors. The cost of distribution is so high these days, and even worse in those days because of all the currency uh, kinds of stuff in the EU, you could lose, when I lived in London for a couple of years, one day just for fun, because I, I uh, travel daily, uh, I put $100 in cash in this pocket, and I got on my plane in London and I flew where I was going. And then uh, I did, when, I, when you work for a big company, and you, all you do is fly around. So there, there were days when I would have breakfast in Eindhoven, uh, lunch outside of Paris, and then dinner in Spain. And, and that's not even an exaggeration. When you live in the UK, you have to prove that you were out of the country for 50 days plus one in order to get a tax return. And I asked my assistant, 
would you go through and look at my calendar? If I've been out of the country 50 days plus one, and she came in a couple days later laughing, and she said, the good news is you were out of the country far more than that. The bad news is over the last 15 months, nowhere in the world, including your own home, have you been for more than four days in a row. I didn't leave Phillips because I didn't like it. I left Phillips because of my wife's health, and I simply couldn't be on an airplane every day. But it was a situation where you looked at what was going on, and I should have known that it had to be strategic and not wasted over a year of my time talking to VCs. And, you know, you talk to people that got out of Stanford Business School last Tuesday, and, uh, <laughs> and they would say things to you like, one guy, remember this, this is a true story, we were at a meeting with Planner Perkins, and I knew the Planner, and, uh, and we've got these people, they got this young guy back here, and he says, I, I just have, I, so I, I have uh, five marketing questions. And I said, cool, what's the first one? And he asked me his first question. And I said, are all five of your questions from uh, Jim Macon's uh, introductory course on marketing at the Stanford <laughs> Business School, are they all that five? Because if so, I can just answer them all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and then I turned to Kleiner and I said, uh, how long do I have to stay before I get to free lunch? Because you guys are not going to invest in this company. But you have to know how to spend your time, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't do a very good job of that for the first six or eight months. I was focused all over the place. Anybody with a checkbook, I'd take a meeting with you. And that was probably not the best way to go. The second thing was, I should have doubled down on it. And what we did, we were talking to the usual suspects. We were talking to the Motorola's, we were talking to the Nokia's, but we weren't talking to the new suspects. And we were out there banging the bushes for strategic partners at exactly the same moment that Apple was finishing the design of this company. And I had done business with Apple. They saved my company accidentally. Uh, remember when Apple, the technology companies, but particularly Apple, had evangelists? Yeah. Well, one of their evangelists came to my office one day. We had just uh, had the number one selling title in the world on some platform came to my office one day and said, we're, we're launching a new computer, and we need a product to send with it that shows off what it can do. I said, what's the new computer? And they said, well, a little bit. I got one here. It's a little box thing. You know? It was the Apple II. And we need something cool. And he showed me what it could do, and I said, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> said, well, if you could just do something for it that's kind of cool, you know, we'll pay for it. I said, how many units can you sell? They said, well, there aren't any out there. And I said, they are. okay, then what kind of unit guarantee are you going to give me? They said, well, I'll tell you what, the marketing people want to bundle it with the computer so there's something for people to do. So we did a golf game. We adored, we took their style guide and threw it away, like we always do with style guides. I don't <laughs> let anybody who works for me read style guides. They deliver them, we throw them away. If they're really big, we recycle them. <laughs> so Apple came in and they said, well, pay for it. I forget what the production budget was. And we will guarantee 25,000 units at $12 a unit. And that will be guaranteed profit for you. And so we said, well, great. So we did. They were out selling Apple IIs. And uh, so one day Apple called my attorney and they said, that we have a problem. And Doug said, what's your problem? They said, uh, the marketing people didn't get the memo only to ship 25,000 units. They shipped some more than that. And Doug said, how many more? They said, well, they shipped 86,000 units. And Doug said, and what's the problem? They said, well, we only had $12 a unit for 25,000 units, and so we don't quite know what to do about the rest. And Doug said, well, I have a little calculator here. Why don't we take 86,000 and multiply times 12? <laughs> Which they did, you know, which they did. And we are at a little company, we're on a milestone basis, and you know, every day's a tough day, and all of a sudden you go, yay, it's the same, that's good for Apple. I gave them all the money back for iPhones over the years, however. <laughs> so, so one of the things I, I, I did, uh, and, and we were just about ready to roll, is that Ball Blazer, for those of you that know the title, it's a sexy title. 
Uh, it uh, was the number one game on the Atari platform on Twitter, ranked stuff like that for a long, long time. Uh, somebody told me it was the number one game just five years ago, I don't know, and they just put it in the Tech Museum in San Jose, uh, a bunch of other cool Atari stuff. And, uh, you know, so I thought, well, that might be a cool title. So I went to Lucas Games and I said, I'm working on this Mega thing, we're going to try to relaunch it, it's going to be on mobile, you guys are not doing mobile, I'd like to license Fall Blazer for mobile. And uh, how Rothman, the attorney, said, why well, yeah, sure. Which happened about two weeks before I saw that final stock ledger for Henry's Army. So I think we're moving in, in the right direction. I get asked to speak every once in a while. I was telling Trevor, uh, I don't get to ask to speak anymore about virtual reality and things like that. I was at a big virtual reality conference by the company that was touting virtual reality. You probably know them. They're fairly well known worldwide. Uh, their second name is Book. First name is the body part. Oh yeah, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and so they asked me to come and talk about AR, VR, XR, all those other Rs. And so I was at a conference and everybody was working for the same company on the panel I was on except for me. And I said that what I, how I'd been spending my time on VR was going around and trying to convince soft, small software developers not to risk their money on this platform. It didn't go over as well as you might think. <laughs> People say all the time, this reminds me of that. Digital media reminds me of the early days of interactive media. And it's just not true. The early days of interactive media, the publisher took the risk. Almost always. You may not get your title published, but if you did, somebody else took the financial risk. I know, I was a publisher. My first budget when I was running Phillips was $42 million. And I was the only person that worked there when they gave me the $42 million. I shouldn't have hired all those other people. It would have gone much better for me personally. <laughs> <laughs> but we were ready to take that risk. And so was Microsoft, and so was EA, and so were lots of other people. That's not true today. So at this little talk, I said, you know, one, one person said, how do I know? How do I know when I should produce for a platform? And I said, if you can sell, if you can sell into three percent of the install base and break even, it's not a bad bet. If there's no install base, somebody else better be guaranteeing the risk. That's what I wanted to do in those early days of Amiga Mobile. I wanted us to take that risk. I wanted to be a publisher. And I had another publisher that was willing to come in, lock, stock, and barrel. So I think there's some things that could have been done if I would have been smarter, and if I would have been earlier, and if I would have been more focused. What I like about what all of you do, to sustain interest in anything, for as long as many of you have, is unusual. It's unusual. It's not just a skill. It's a mental talent that you're that committed to something, you're that into something, you can spend that amount of mental energy on something and sustain it over time. I like that about the people I met, most of the people I met, that worked at Amiga. I knew those people were all in. All I needed to do is get together the resources to support it, maybe a little bit of leadership, and hire a whole bunch of more people. It's not that hard if you hire good people, you've got the resources to support them, you're clear about where you hope you're going, and you launch stuff on time. That, for me, is the software business. It's not an easy business, but it's not rocket science. My son tells me, my, my son works for NASA, he's constantly telling me that nothing I've ever done is rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep telling him, this crappy little games paid your way through Stanford. <laughs> tell you more stories about my background, but I don't think it's really necessary. Uh, I started Fathom Pictures by accident. Uh, 
I was uh, I was at the University of Washington. It was my first academic gig, and I wanted to get out of there desperately. Uh, I didn't realize how good I had it. It was the golden days of graduate education. My full teaching load was four courses a year. <laughs> I remember I had a really tough day on one of the terms because I had to teach two courses on a Tuesday. I didn't do anything in the other six days of the week, but two courses, man. You know, it, it could wear you out. <laughs> yeah, these things were 50 minutes long. You're talking about, you know. And, uh, so I didn't realize how good I had it, but I wanted to come back to California. I wanted to get involved in more innovative kind of stuff. So what I did is I told people in Northern California that I produced computer-controlled movies. And they all went, well, that's really cool. And then I told people in LA that I produced computer-controlled movies. Uh -huh. Obviously, I have to live up near Silicon Valley where all the smart computer people are. And they all went, well, that's really great. You know, that's terrific. And uh, no one believed me. No one had any idea what computer-controlled movies were, including me. And so <laughs> it did not go as well as you had hoped. But one day, the president of Lucasfilm called and said, are you the guy that does the computer-controlled movies? <laughs> I'm your guy. <laughs> and he said, we started Lucas Games Group 18 months ago. And what they did is they hired all of the people at NYIT's technology program, moved all of those academics to Marin County. They were all in sound. And then they wondered why they didn't have a product after two years. And so he said, do you think you could, like, get a product out? You know, and I said, absolutely, not a problem. And what I learned is that with enough butcher paper and different color markers and enough time and oftentimes uh, some stimulants, <laughs> you could design stuff. You know, you could design stuff. And so we did. We designed Escape in Cyber City, the first interactive, hand-painted cell animation title ever made. When we won every animation award on the planet. I'll tell you, if you want to get treated really well, do something that's animated and then go to France. They have the carpets they lay out for you, you got the really small cars and stuff, and you know, they give you prizes. And uh, you know, so that was a big deal, and we turned that into a coin up game. It was the first laser disc game ever made. And so we decided to test it at the bar that was down below our office. So here we got it. We didn't call it Escape from Cyber City. We called it something. It was an animated, anime title out of Japan. We, had, we designed it and had the animation done at Toei Animation in Japan. So we decided to test it down, downstairs. And so we put it down there, you know, and we said, well, we should go down and check it out. And the guy that owned the bar called and said, get this thing out of here. And you go, why? He said, it's broken. I said, how can it be broken? You're going to have it for a day. And he said, just get it out of here. I don't want it here anymore. Everybody's complaining. So we went downstairs, you know, and there was a tragic flaw. The coin box was full. <laughs> <laughs> totally full. <coughs> the average coin drop in those days in an arcade for a hit game was about 115 bucks a week. We were doing $300 a day in quarters. Now, we did have a problem. You couldn't make laser just last very long. But that's a whole different story. <laughs> but when we did that, and then we moved that over to platforms, it was a huge hit. So my little teeny company had the number one and two, number two best-selling titles in the world on the CDI platform. You go, well, that wasn't a very big platform. Well, we sold 460,000 units of Palm Springs Open. And more than that, the Ball Blazer. I did ask the question, how is it that we've sold more units in software than there are hardware installed in the entire world. How, how did this possibly happen? And he said, oh, that's because we packaged one for free and then gave people a coupon to buy another one for 20% off. And I said, people did that? <laughs> About 150,000 of them, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, 
I've lost a tremendous respect for the consumer. <laughs> but I think it provides an opportunity for a lot of us. <laughs> what am I doing now? A couple of people ask that. I'm doing two things, really. I, I got involved in environmental technology about six years ago. And uh, we were very involved. In, those of you who live in California, there's a proposal, not a proposal, now it's becoming a real thing, of putting solar panels over the California aqueduct. Uh, if you do that, and we're doing it now. There's a demonstration project in, uh, down in Tulare County. Uh, and uh, what it would do is if we put solar panels over the 340 miles, the flatter part of the aqueduct, you generate about 40 to 45 percent of the total electricity demand of the entire state of California five years out. You save between 60 and 80 billion gallons of water a year because of the fact that it's covered and there's no evaporation. You would decrease the temperature of the water by two and a half to three degrees, cutting down allergy and decreasing maintenance costs by fifty million dollars. And there are no land use issues. The land is already being used as a canal. You don't have to go out and do this and do that. So we are very involved in that. We're very happy that it's happening now. And if you're interested afterwards, and after Trevor and I have had a chance to drink the whiskey, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> <laughs> and then I turn my attention more recently to air to water technologies. Uh, a friend of mine's brother is the head of, uh, of Navajo Nation. I don't know how many of you ever spend any time in Navajo land, Hopi land. Um, so aside from you know, trying to kill all the indigenous people, uh, <laughs> kill their food sources and stuff like that, we realized we couldn't kill all of them. We said, well, we'll just go get some land. It'll take a little while because we have to figure out where the absolute worst land in the entire United States is. And once we determine that, that's where we'll put you. And that's what Navajo Nation looks like. And they have no water. None. The water that they have in these little teeny communities is brought in by truck. So we started researching 15 months ago air to water technologies. We come up with about 13 or 14. There's one that's extraordinary. And if you have a little time this evening or tomorrow or whatever, and you want to look at something that's absolutely amazing, look at source, S O U R T E, source.co. And you will see all of their technologies. You will see all of the installations they're doing around the world. So here's how it works. It looks kind of like a solar panel. Heavier, thicker. And if you live in an area with 15% humidity, it will generate about 2.5 gallons of water a day. But they just released their new panel called the R3, which is 30% more efficient than the R2 was. So I ran a graph. I went back 20 years. I went back to one week after I was here last time. I went back 20 years, and I said, where has solar gone in terms of efficiency over the last 20 years? And I ran that graph. Then I ran the first three years of source. And if they stay on the same trajectory, 10 years and 15 years from now, your kids and mine are going to be drinking water that they pull out of the air. And they're going to be drinking it at a very low cost. And what I'm excited about this is, this is the first thing I've done in my life, I think, where I might be able to save a life, maybe a couple. So it's a good way to, save my, to spend my time. And there's another thing that I've got in the back of my mind. I've tried it three different times. I cannot make this happen. I love games, but they're very, very, very specific. And I think that auto sports is the most lucrative category of gaming in the world. Only because there's so many things you can do with it. So I tried them. I'm kissing auto sports frogs like crazy. <laughs> I tried and tried and tried to find a company that really wants to do something innovative in the auto sports category. This is the moment where I'm sad that I left Phyllis. Because I know I could walk into Jan Timmer's office and say, I want to focus on auto sports. I need $50 million. And he said, get out of my office and come back when you've done it. And you just don't find that very often. Thank you so much for inviting me to see you. If you have any questions or comments, I'll be very honest. If I don't know the answer to something, I'll freely tell you. Any questions or comments or anything like I've that? I've got a microphone as well. <coughs> so do I. I don't want you walking through this maze. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, anybody?
Okay. Wonderful speech. Great. Well, once again, thank you guys, and you know, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. One question. Yeah. Come on, Trevor. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know one question. Uh, first of all, thank you for contributing to the book. You provide a lot of really useful information, uh, information I've never heard before, uh, and I think most people in this room have not heard before. Um, you, I think you said when, in, in the book that, uh, and you freely admitted that it was a failure at the MIGA. But the might work, yes. Yeah, well, but you really enjoyed the, the experience of the community. Uh, and I think you said that uh, it reminded remind you of a uh, community that, that, you know, that, that supports uh, veteran cars or whatever. Okay, again. Uh, I think you classic said cars. classic cars. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody has a weakness. <laughs> <laughs> and mine is buying, restoring, and crashing <laughs> classic Porsches. <laughs> Buying is expensive, restoring is more so, crashing really ruins your bank account. <laughs> so I'll tell you, do you think we can, are we recording all this? We okay. can stop. We I'm going to deny the story that comes out. <laughs> <laughs> so we're racing Porsches at Laguna Seca. We had track time and all that kind of stuff. And this friend of mine has, I, mine was just a nice older one that was kind of nice. It wasn't tricked out or anything, it was just a car, you know. And a friend of mine had one totally tricked out, expensive as can be. And he would say, he would say things when you do time trying, he would say, how, how do you go one second faster this time on the track than you did last time? He said, oh, that's about $5,000. <laughs> so you put five thousand dollars in new stuff in your car, you can gain about a second. How many seconds did you gain? He said, eh, I don't know, ten or twelve. They're going, holy smoke! So we're racing, and they had the pit there. You know, you know, when you're just out there, you, you never stop at the pit. He pulled into the pit, and the pit has a safety curve. They all do. And the safety curve is to keep you from going out of the pit and running into somebody who's coming down. He hit the safety curve in the middle of a 911 arm. Turbo car. And rolled the underside of that car oh. as if you're opening a can of oh. We felt it's possible the farmer's insurance wasn't going to cover this. <laughs> <laughs> flatbed truck and a lift and we drove outside about 20 miles and we found a place on the roadway that had one of those curb things they set up. <laughs> and so we drove one of the other cars toward this curb and hit the brakes so we had a lot of skid marks and laid this sucker right over there. <laughs> Well, the insurance company covered it and everybody was happy. <laughs> well, there's more than one way. And then a technology cult and a car cult are pretty darn similar. <laughs> you guys spend money in silly ways. I know. <laughs> so that you can make your machine go one second faster. I have to take a dictionary. <laughs> Let's have another hand for Dr. Gary here. say it would be totally anticlimactic, so I'll try to avoid that. Uh, and so uh, thank you, Gary, and thank you for all of you who have come this evening. Uh, I understand it is the usual uh, after party, whatever that is and wherever it is. Uh, you know, I've heard about it, but I have no details. So you'll have to uh, 
you know, figure out that on your own. I'm sure you're kidding. <laughs> so uh, thank you for coming to the banquet. We hope to see you all tomorrow morning for the rest of the show. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Well, hold on. I didn't get to pick up a chair and take it outside. And then he put the rest of the chairs outside. Because no, seriously, we need a little help because we got to convert this back into the show floor. So we'll do that with the other festivities. Yeah, I'm going to take a chance.